My name is John Keating, um, I'm CEO of a company called Finicom, we're a wireless consultancy um, system integrator. Um, so we consult on wireless strategy, we work for mobile operators, that type of thing, and then in system integration we build uh, systems to provide extra capacity or coverage in difficult to reach areas. So we've done projects like Gatwick Airport, uh, Viva Stadium, Central Bank of Ireland, that type of thing. Um, before, um, before joining Villicom, I moved to Villicom about 17 years. Be before Villicom, I worked in uh, the UK with three on the first 3G network in Europe, and before that in Chicago for Lucent Technologies, and uh, before that then I was at ESAT Digifone. So I'm a mobile guy. I say wireless, but I'm mostly mobile. Um, just get this clicker working, sorry. There we go. So, I was coming to work there um, a couple of months ago, and I was listening to a podcast on the phone. And there was a chap on talking, and he was talking about the price of light. And back in Babylonian times, they had these lamps, and they ran on sesame oil. And you'd, a full day's work from an average labourer would give you about 10 minutes of light. Okay. Oops, sorry. And then if you want to be really stingy, there's actually this board called a storm petrel that you can stick a wick down the middle of. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. There's actually this board called a storm petrel you can shove a wick down its throat and it's a very oily board because it eats a lots of fish and that's a very cheap candle, but I don't think it smells very good, okay? <laughs> sorry, but these guys did a study. They wanted to look at how the price of light had evolved over the guts of two, three thousand years, okay? For yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they wanted to see how it evolved. They're economists and they want to work on pricing and how much things really cost. And this is really what's happened with the price of light, okay? So for a lumen hour, so 40,000 pounds for a lumen hour back in the, the 14th century, down to peanuts today, okay? It costs very little. We take it for granted. And back then, life happened during the day, and when it got dark, you went to bed, and that was it, okay? Um, but it kind of struck a chord with me. Because, you know, in telecoms, we've followed, not a 40,000 pound to nothing journey, but we've followed a similar journey in the last few years. So what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, <coughs> just going to have a look a little bit at the telecoms industry data. The commercial end of things, what's happened. Um, what's happened to prices in our industry. We'll talk a little bit about how that's affected the market. I suppose the Institute of Engineers, so we talk a little bit about the technology that's enabled it. No hard questions from these guys. Um, what that change has been like in context, what the wider effects have been and what, what they may be, and maybe a little bit about what's coming next. So in 2006, this thing came along. It's a Huawei E220 modem, okay? And what we had before 2006 was what is typically called a candy bar phone with an LCD display. You can't push that much information through a screen that size, okay? And what this did was it opened up the screen to the size of your laptop and you could plug, in, plug it into the laptop. And it became a very rich experience. Then in early 07, the first capacitive touchscreen phone came along, the LG Prada. And then later in time, this beauty came along and the thing really took off. And what you had is a very interactive screen, lots of software and a demand for data. And this is what happened. Okay, so between 2010 and 2015, the price per gigabyte for mobile data fell from £16 to £1.50. It's a massive fall. And the equivalent in Ireland, the price per gigabyte for data roughly fell from £24 or €24 Euros to €1.20. Euro okay, a huge fall. I think that's an incredible achievement. There's not many industries. If I said to you, I'm not sure what industries you all work in, if I said to you I can strip out 95% of your cost base in seven years, you'd be like, whoa, I've won the lottery. Okay, and we haven't done that in telecoms, but it is, it is an incredible achievement. There was a famous quote, a guy in 1954, he was on the Atomic Energy Commission, he said atomic energy would make electricity too cheap to meter, that we just charge it for the connection. Okay, and actually, depending on what mobile operator you're on, if you have an unlimited data tariff, actually mobile data is too cheap to meter, they just charge you 20 or 30 quid a month. Okay. And ironically now, cheap data is used to moderate electricity demand through smart metering. So that supply shift has led to a 20-fold demand increase for data. Okay, so you've gone from 5.5 million gigabytes to 112, 113 million gigabytes. Okay? At the moment, the data demand in aggregate is growing, depending on what country you're in, between 50 and 70% per annum. 
it's huge. It's a doubling of uh, a doubling of traffic. Like in London, it doubles every year, really. You know, in Dublin, it doubles every sort of 20 months, 22 months, that type of thing. So it's huge. And there's a huge amount of work has to go into the networks and into the technology to enable that. So if you look at that, what that means for a typical user, um, <coughs> if you're on a £25 a month uh, package, you know, back in 2008, that'd give you 500 minutes. Today, it's unlimited minutes. There's no point in, in metering it. Um, you might have got, you know, for your 500 meg package, you might have used 10% of that on app data, and now you can use a gig and a half. YouTube has gone from two hours usage to 32 hours usage, if you want to use it, two hours to 32 hours. At the same time as actually the screen resolution has gone from 360p to 1080p, and that is one of the secrets, actually, if you go from a 3G upgrade to 4G upgrade, and you do nothing else, you use the same usage. Your data usage will actually jump massively because apps like YouTube will sense that you're on a, uh, a wider bandwidth connection, they will feed you more data. So you don't even know this is happening, but your data consumption is rising significantly. Like that as well, Twitter, if you're a Twitter app user, the videos will start to autoplay in your Twitter stream. Web pages has gone up a lot, and even web pages have expanded massively in size over that period. They're starting to shrink again because the web developers are getting a bit of sense and they want their pages to go quickly. And music downloads and emails and so on. So it's been a huge transfer of value from to consumers and over the top players. So your Amazons, your Facebooks, <coughs> yeah, your Googles to an extent, really rely on this fat data pipe that the mobile operators provide. And it's a big part of their valuation because you're able to push your data up there and pull data back down. And consumers get a huge benefit. And it has been a massive transfer of value away from the shareholders of telecoms companies. So the white line there shows uh, the Stocks Europe 600 Telecoms Index. And you can see how that compares to other industries. It's the worst performing one in that period there that I've taken. And it's reflected in the brand value too. So how has this supply shift been achieved? So this is the traditional view of how you expand capacity on a cellular network. So back in the 70s or whatever, you put up a transmitter. If you wanted another connection, you added a new frequency or a new transceiver. And you kept adding frequencies, and that gave you connection after connection. And you would share the connection then through push to talk as well. Um, but when you ran out of frequencies, you ran out of capacity. So what cell, you're, what cell splitting says is you reuse the, the red channels here, and by the time they've died away, you use a smaller cell. You reuse them, and you reuse them, and reuse them. And you grow the capacity of your network by splitting cells. So as it gets busier, so you know, back in the old analog days, the tax networks, the base stations were on the RTE broadcast towers, then they came down into the suburbs, into the city, and then there were microcells, say on Grafton Street, two antennas on the side of a shop, just covering 100 metres of a street. And that has been the view. And then there was a view maybe five years ago that's, that would continue down into small cells and there'd be small cells on every lamppost. And there are some out there, some in London, more in Asia actually than there are here, but there's not a lot out there. You know, other technology has come on to postpone, like that day will come, but postpone it. It's been a massive increase in spectrum consumption, particularly for mobile. So there's been over 900 million in Ireland raised in spectrum auctions since 2012. In the UK, they've raised 22 billion in spectrum auctions over the last 15, 16 years. It's a lot of money. So back in when I started on the ESAT rollout, ESAT Digiphone rollout, there was 28 or 29 megs of spectrum allocated out to mobile. Then in 2012, there's 450 megs of spectrum allocated out to mobile. And there's, there's 800 megs licensed at the moment, but it's not fully used because the 3.6 gig has been deployed as well. So that's a huge growth in spectrum consumption. Um, if you're interested, after you can go on to um, Ofcom's website and you can look at the spectrum map and you can, it's interactive and you can click and see what the different uses, uses are. It's quite good that. And the o mobile operators now need to be very careful as well for emissions compliance because they're putting a lot of spectrum wide bandwidth up which increases the power. So in the, we have to stick to limits set by the Ichner, which is a body in Germany. Um, but a lot of sites were designed years ago for 40, 60 watts and now there's kilowatts coming out and particularly if there's two operators sharing a site. And what can happen is if you have an antenna pointing across the street you can actually end up with the exclusion zone on the building across the road. So that's quite important. But as well as applying uh, more spectrum to the network, you also need to make the use of the spectrum more efficient. 
So release seven, your peak bit rate of maybe 1.3 bits per second per hertz, moving up to SISO, single input, single output, I'll talk about that in a minute, 4.3 bits per second per hertz, 16 bits for four by four MIMO, and 31 bits per second for eight by eight MIMO, okay? I'll show you how that's done now in a second. So this is the, the Shannon limit. So what the Shannon limit describes is how much data you can shove down a noisy channel, okay? So we're all the time trying to separate the background noise and the noise of other traffic from the signal that we want. We want to separate the signal and the noise. And what that says is that the maximum achievable capacity is a function of the, the bandwidth and the signal to noise ratio, okay? Now, <coughs> for a long time, depending on your code and the modulation techniques, you know, networks didn't reach that limit. But then they reached that limit around 06, 07. Not quite, but almost to that limit with the, with the DSPs that had come out and the signal processing techniques, a lot of si processing power, particularly in um, ASIC designs, the likes that Zionix make to go into handsets, you could get close to that. So it's all about playing here, boosting your signal or discriminating against your noise. So one of the early things you can do uh, in a few years now is you split the base station and you put the remote radio head up the tower and you boost the signal. So instead of having the feeder losses here between the antenna and the, and the base station, you have the RF conversion going on up close to the antennas and then you have digital coming down where there's effectively no losses. So that gives you 2 dB on the signal. So again, you're boosting your signal versus your noise. And that you you need to use higher or order modulation. So you're going from QPSK to 16 quant, even 64 quant. So that your different symbols are closer together. And better receivers allow you to discriminate between symbols that are closer together. And that massively increases the bit rate. And even they go up to much higher levels on the microwave transmission links that go between the, the base stations. Uh, MIMO, multiple input, multiple out transmit and receive antennas, they exploit multipath. So you have antennas receiving the signal that's maybe coming from that way, and some of the signal maybe reflects off that wall and comes from that way, and you combine the two and, and you double your, double your bandwidth. And massive MIMOs, we have a couple of sites in the UK where someone stuck massive MIMO antennas on them. Uh, this is a 64 element one. Um, now what you actually need to do, I think I'll talk about it in a couple of slides, is change that to an active antenna, because you can't run that many feeders down a, down a tower. Uh, carrier aggregation. So with all that spectrum, it's um, it's not such a big deal to play in all that spectrum in a base station because your equipment goes into a 19-inch rack. It's in a cab and it's on a roof. There's lots of space. It's connected to the mains, so you can do it. It's very difficult to do that in a handset. It's running off a 3,000 milliamp hour battery. has to fit in your pocket. can't get hot. So um, much more difficult to do. But you can use, so rather than using wideband carriers, you use carrier aggregation. So you might use the carrier there and the carrier next to it, or a carrier in a different band, or the carrier next to you in the same band, that type of thing. You get the idea. And that can give you, in theory, up to three, three gigabit per handset. So we had a guy testing a site there a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's an indoor site, and he has 530 megabit. 530 megabit on, a, on his Samsung S9, is it? Samsung S9. It's just incredible. I don't know why you'd want 530 megabit on a handset, you know, you'd have to watch 50-odd high-definition movies at the same time to take advantage of it, but <laughs> customers want it, so we give it to them. Equipment miniaturization. This has been incredible, actually. That's a, that's a site we did uh, in 2010, and I can't actually show you a picture of the room properly because there's so much gear in the room, you can't see the room. But that, that, that site will deliver about one and a half gigabit. And you can see there's lots of feeder cables, lots of equipment cabins, Cabinets in 19 inch racks there. It's pretty chocker. And that's it today. Um, now the room isn't tidy because the guys haven't finished, but there's, you, there's two racks there. There's a couple of racks there. That's the fiber presentation. The rest of the room is empty, okay? And uh, that's an incredible shrinkage in my mind. Um, huge savings in cooling, uh, space, and carbon emissions. Um, we spend a lot of time in telecoms heating things up and cooling them down at the same time. So we basically have a heater at this side of the room and a chiller at that side of the room and the two of them are in competition with each other. 
Um, that architecture I showed you earlier as well with the, with the remote radio heads, that helps a lot with that as well. So I know a couple of companies in the UK have made a lot of money removing aircon from base station sites because the remote radio heads are up at the top of the mast and they don't need to chill the gear anymore. There's been a lot of increased vendor competition as well has brought down the price of the base station. So a couple of new entrants to the market uh, from the far east. So, you know, Huawei there with 30% market share. Really, you didn't know who they were 15 years ago. Mm. It's been a phenomenal growth story. Huawei, I think they do like, they're driving on for 100 billion a year at the moment. It's just incredible. And, uh, you know, that's forced some of the European players to merge. But it's vastly reduced the cost of the hardware on site. I remember when I went to work in the Middle East first and I saw what they were paying in Saudi Arabia for base stations. And I just left Ireland, which it was like a quarter because they were using the, the Asian vendors down there. And that, that will continue to accelerate JAR with virtualization. So um, this is basically the commoditization of hardware. Um, so there's a lot of the base station elements now can be virtualized on Dell servers. You use a standard Dell server on a site, uh, particularly in inbuilding actually. And then there's a move from passive to active antennas. So the first few sites with active antennas that we worked on were coming up uh, late last year. And if you think about it, if you're a traditional vendor and the hardware is virtualizing, you really want to be in the antenna because it, everything has to go through an antenna eventually. So Huawei set up a massive antenna factory in Germany a few years ago, and I think Ericsson have just bought Catherine, I think, as well. So um, you really want to be in the antenna, and that allows you to start doing the massive MIMO without all those feeders and beam steering and all that in the future. And automation, there's a huge amount of automation. Um, a lot of stuff happens without human intervention on the networks now compared to years ago. So plug and play configuration, um, a lot of the base stations now, you connect them up to their transmission link, they discover the core network, they self-configure, they get themselves up and running. Whereas before, you would have to send a technician to site and they'd maybe spend two, three hours loading scripts files, whatever they had to, to load into it. Son, we've one customer that's reduced the size of their optimization team by about 60%. So there's 10 fewer people on that team, skilled engineers, because they're using a, a self optimizing network from Cisco where the network tunes itself be depending on the behavior that it sees. And this is kind of your AI starting to impinge on, on the telecoms industry. And, it, and it, w it works to an extent. It's not as good as people, but you know, you can still, you still need the people. But you're more tuning the sun now rather than tuning the network. And then in the non-engineering side of things, there's a lot of online self-service, digital channels for selling, interacting with customers. Um, it puts a lot of pressure on the billing systems, actually. You've got to put in new provisioning and all that sort of thing. So there's a real need, actually, with, to get that cost. If you want to keep that going down that cost curve, because the usage curve has gone up like that, there's a real need to apply simpler business models and untangle how telecoms operators operate. There's been over a one third reduction in telecoms employment in the last 10 or so years. So in Europe, it's down by about 33% from just about 1.2 million telecoms people to about 780,000. And in Ireland, it's gone down by about 40%, so 26,500 to 16,000. So it's a, big, it's a big effect. And just maybe to put this a little bit in context, how this compares with other innovations we've had, um, you know, I suppose a newcomer come up with the pump to pump out the coal mines and they could dig deeper and get the coal. The price of coal fell by about 40% over 90 years, you know, and you had a whole industrial revolution, the growth of cities and, and all that sort of crack. Books. I was actually listening to the radio um, on the way in. I don't know if anyone heard it on News Talk. Apparently you had to kill 170 sheep to make a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> to get the vellum, right? But the printing press um, reduced the cost of books by about 55% over 100 years, okay? Grain, 1980 to 2010, 65% fall because of fertilizers and irrigation. Uh, oil, over 20 years, power drilling reduced the cost of oil by about 77%. And that gives us a lot of things, right? The oil industry gives us a lot of things over the next 100 years. Lighting, which I spoke about earlier, but just in the 40 years from the filament bulb, Cost of lighting fell 80%. Air freight, this one's surprising actually. The jet engine has reduced the cost of air freight by 90% because there's spare cargo space underneath where all the people are flying. 
And there's our industry there, data transmission, 95% over seven years. And the absolute daddy of them all, DRAMs, 99.997% cost reduction in, in uh, 10 years. That's Moore's law, right? So Moore's law is broken now, but it, it ran well for 30, 40 years. And you know, this is only seven years in. Let's see. There's far reaching effects. When you do these type of supply curve shifts, there's massive effects. So, for example, um, I'm a bit of a statistical wonk. I can't help myself. I come from a telecoms background, so I like stats. Um, they're going to have to um, restate UK GDP by about 2%. And I think the UK economy from memory is over a billion pounds or trillion pounds. It's a lot of money because they haven't been properly. When you set GDP growth, you look at the deflation of prices. With the 95% fall in telecoms prices, they, they reckon as a 2% understatement built up over seven or eight years. Um, and also, it's a complete mystery to me why there's price regulations in Europe on an industry that's reducing its cost at that rate. So there's a lot of price pressure on from national and European regulators on telco operators, despite the fact that they've cut prices that much. US adults now spend 11 hours a day consuming media. 11 hours a day. That's incredible. How do time? How do they get time to work and sleep on top of that? It's just and eat. Well, they eat while they're watching TV, don't they, in America? Yeah. This is my view of the St. Patrick's Day parade uh, a couple of weeks ago. People are absolutely addicted to their smartphones. So I, I moved to the left. It was okay. I got to see some of the parade. But you had your phone there. You took that photo. <laughs> you were at it. I used the film camera, John. Does anyone know where that is? Has anyone seen that picture? Actually, zoomed up, you can see where it is. That's the ma that's mass in the Vatican. Mass. The Pope is saying mass. Actually, I only realised you zoomed it up. You can actually see St. Peter's there on the tablet. Yeah. <laughs> thousands and thousands of smartphones and tablets at mass. I like this tweet. A guy said, the Matrix, when you saw it first, you're like, that's a really cool phone. And if you watch it again, you go, that's a really cool way of staying off the internet for a few hours. <laughs> Um, I've tried to stick a little bit with data in these things, uh, but everybody knows education has been transformed by cheap data, right? Anyone who's children knows that the children learn more from YouTube nearly than they do in school, right? There's very little data around it, but one piece of data is the massively open online courses. That's the growth of them there. So you can do a university degree, uh, not for free, not a good one for free anyway, but you can do reasonably cheap university degree using MOOCs. This is massive. Teenagers aren't sleeping. Um, the glue to their phones and their sleep patterns are massively affected. Now, some people say it's the blue light, but there's no proof of that. And uh, they don't hang out with their friends anymore either. So they can get a lot of entertainment and interaction without going out of the house. Or can you go back to that one? It's an article in The Atlantic. I thought I, I have it cited, but it's chopped off by the. Okay, fitness culture. There's a lot of people hooked on these fitness apps, and I remember reading. I was reading some McKinsey study or whatever that the Internet of Things would add two years to the average lifespan. I was like, oh, that's nonsense. I'll check my Strava and I'll see what everyone else in the cycling club is doing. That's how that works, right? You're out exercising because you're interacting over cheap data with your friends, or maybe you're wearing a Fitbit and it gives you an early warning about it a heart problem you're going to have. Physical shipments are down massively, so nobody buys games on discs anymore, right? So think about this now for a second. Each one of those boxes, the containers, they're four tons empty before you put anything in them. Four tons. They're very heavy. So it's a lot of CO2 savings, energy savings, a lot of waste. Evergreen design. And this is a great concept. We are... <coughs> as a society, stuck into a loop, a consumption loop. Um, and a huge part of capitalism is based on consuming products, discarding and buying new products and so on and so forth. If you can upgrade your product without f in, a, in a virtual way instead of a physical way, it's a lot better for the environment and it's a lot more sustainable. And the reason I have a picture of a Tesla there is, um, I don't know if any of you read this, a few years ago there was a woman uh, had a bad accident on the, interest <coughs> on the freeway in California. And what happened was, there was a piece of tyre on, on, on the road. She hit the piece of tyre. It pierced the lithium battery. Lithium does not like being exposed to air. 
and the whole thing went up like a bomb, right? So Tesla had a look at that and they said, well, why did it happen? <coughs> the car is riding too low on the road. Why is it riding too low on the road? Because we wanted to handle well. We don't need to handle well in an interstate. So we put something in the software in the car that'll raise the car two inches when we're on the interstate. So instead of doing a recall, they did an over-the-air software update into the cars instead of a safety recall. Okay? Now, Volkswagen at the moment are tying with the idea. You know the way you can buy a Volkswagen Golf and it's a TDI, then you get a TD with a red eye, then a TDI with a red D, red eye, and then a GT TDI. They're all the same car, right? It's different software in them. And they are tying with the idea that you can upgrade your car uh, through a software upgrade over the air instead of actually buying a new physical car. Um, be a lot of consumer resistance to that at the moment because people <coughs> with the ordinary TDI feel like they're getting ripped off. But people will come around to it. So it's the idea of evergreen software or evergreen design that you're not throwing things away anymore, you're upgrading them through their software. Here's one. Road fatalities have been dropping um, in most of the developed world. This is UK data. For 40 years they've been falling as cars have gotten safer. And then eight years ago they stopped falling. But actually, driver fatalities kept falling, pedestrian fatalities are going up. Because people are, once the traffic slows down, they're on the phone. And also, there's a migration towards SUVs as well, which are more likely to kill a pedestrian too. But it's the two things together. And there's some health diagnosis starting to happen. The way you interact with your phone, you can diagnose depression. It's, there's early products out on that now at the moment. And then there's the whole election thing that happened in America, maybe in the referendum in the UK, social control. And social activism, that's uh, Admiralty Square in Hong Kong. And all these people have their phones out because they're organising their demonstrations over social media. And what happened here actually was the Chinese government shut down the data connections, so they all got apps to do Bluetooth mesh networking and they could still communicate. I thought that was quite good. And smarter cities. So there's a massive migration towards the cities. Um, about 10% of the Irish population <coughs> has mo moved out of the countryside into the city in the last 10 years. Um, and the cities would be miserable places to live if that trend continues and we don't make the city more efficient, cleaner, more livable. So um, I've shown the big belly bin there because when Dunleary rat down council got into trouble in the financial crisis, a lot of the local authorities did, they converted to smart bins. And instead of going around and emptying every bin every day, the smart bin tells the council of when it needs to be emptied and then they send a truck. So they're able to, they didn't have to let anybody go, but they were able to redeploy a lot of the, the, the bin collectors. So just a little bit of what's coming next. This is a Boston Consulting Group. They're predicting a further 60% fall in 4G networking costs. This is after a 95% fall, further 60% fall over the next few years. And actually, if you switch to 5G, you're talking about a 90, over a 90% fall. So that, that curve will actually continue for a few more years. This is starting to gain traction now, but it's going to take off in a big way. It's the industrial internet. Now, my point is, the point I'm trying to get across here is, <coughs> I don't think, you know, when the steam engine was invented to pump out mines, anyone could have predicted the rise of megacities or the outbreak of cholera, right? But those type of supply curve shifts, they lead to un unintended consequences, good and bad. So with 5G, you're talking about ultra-reliable, low-latency communication. So it's like your, your self-driving cars, that type of thing, or platooning cars. Massive machine type communication, which is your mostly low ba bandwidth, lots of devices in smart cities, in manufacturing, and your enhanced mobile broadband, which is more or less like your augmented reality, that type of thing where you need a lot of bandwidth. These are the projected impacts or the projected revenues for communications in these verticals. So telecoms is breaking out of this phone in your pocket thing and it's going into different industry sectors. Um, it's going into the likes of uh, gaming, you know, uh, connected cars, uh, manufacturing plants, smart manufacturing, smart products, that type of thing. And one of the things about that is today at the moment, uh, I, th I think I said to you about 150 I think a gig for consumer data. For uh, machine type data it's about 30 euros a gig. It doesn't use as much but you know it aggregates up as 30 euros a gigabit. And that's the growth of just on, um, I'm only talking about mobile because that's an easy source of data. There are alternative wireless technologies for IoT. You have Sigfox, you have LoRa, that sort of stuff. 
Um, but the growth is about 25% per annum on devices that are connected via a mobile network. That's good growth industry. And the thing is, a product, if you connect it to the internet, it's as smart as the internet. It's a, the internet is a giant supercomputer in a way. So if you connect something to the internet, it's as smart as it. So the effects of huge supply curve shifts are unpredictable. For 5G, there's actually pent up demand. So I was around for the 2G wave, the 3G wave, the 4G <coughs> wave. I'm getting older now. But the 5G wave, like when 3G was there, for the first three or four years, there was a lot of telco people scratching their head. What's the killer app? How is this going to take off? How are we going to make it lift? Okay, and that's maybe where the pricing got a little bit out of kilter. For 5G, there's people in other industry verticals talking to the telco vertical, saying, we want this now. When can you have it? We want it tomorrow. So you had, um, I was at a talk two years ago where the CTO Rolls-Royce engines, aero engines, he was saying, I want this. I want to be able to do 30 gigs a month from an aircraft engine. Um, the there was a guy from, um, I think it was Jaguar Land Rover, just two weeks ago, saying, we need 5G, we need it now. That's a car company. These things generate about 25 gigabytes of data an hour. There's 180 ECUs in, in, in a Range Rover. Now, if it's in a Range Rover today, it's in a Ford Fiesta tomorrow. That's how the car industry works. <coughs> 25 gigs an hour. There was a guy, the guy who runs the connected car in JLR was saying to me, we might need to hook it up to your home Wi-Fi. I was like, not a chance. Just no way, like... And a long haul flight generates terabytes of data. And you know, a lot of the, um, why do you buy an aircraft engine? Nobody wants an aircraft engine, right? They want thrust. That's what they need. They don't need the engine, they want the push. So um, the likes of uh, Rolls-Royce and GE sell power by the hour now. So you land and uh, the engine connects to the network and it tells uh, Rolls-Royce how many hours of thrust, how many pounds of thrust it produced, and then you get the bill from Rolls-Royce. You don't get charged for the engine. Um, we did a system a few years ago in Dublin Airport for Aer Lingus and the flight manuals. So apparently flight manuals weigh 25 kilos. I didn't know that. But they put them on tablets. And then they were like, why can't the data go onto the tablet? He was like, because you use an edge, whatever. But we did an upgrade for them. But the, the tablet takes it from 25 kilos down to whatever the weight of an Apple iPad is. And the fuel savings across the aircraft fleet for that are absolutely massive. It's about getting back to sustainability as well. That's why I like the in, in industrial internet. You can't do big data analytics without big data pipes. If you take a smart city, the average European city would have about 10,000 households per square kilometer. So you have the people in there and you have their phones, right? And maybe you have their TVs. But then if you give each, if you give each household there a, a smart electricity <coughs> meter, smart gas meter, smart water meter, that's 10,000, 10,000, 10,000 on top of the houses. Then you have the traffic lights, the connected cars, the bins, the lighting, whatever you're having yourself. You're getting into a massive density of connections. So the change is actually happening more quickly, I think, than a lot of people realise. Um, my brother till recently worked in, in the plant that manufactures 5G chipsets. They can't make them fast enough to run on the lines 24-7. And he was asking me where they're going. I said, I don't know, because they're not here, but they're going somewhere. And they're, they're not being stockpiled, they're being, they're being used. So the 20th century is dead, right? Um, new mental models. If you're running a business, or you're running a government body or a charity, whatever it is, the models that you use mentally to do that activity 20 years ago no longer apply. You need to think in a new way. If you think, it, like, very soon, I think Villacom will hire the first person that didn't live in the 20th century, that was actually born in the new millennium. That's not that far away, maybe this year or next year, we'll hire that person. Mm -hmm. These people are different than the previous generation. And that change is happening more quickly now because of things like cheap data. I love this picture. Um, we did some work in Djibouti a few years ago, but this is um, John, John Stanmire. Does anyone know who John Stanmire is? He's a world photographer of the year, whatever year this picture came out. He won world pho photograph of the year. And these are P Somalians, and they're down on the beach at night in Djibouti and they're holding the phone up because they want to get the signal from the network in, S in Somalia so they don't have to pay Roman charges. But they want to keep in touch with their families. You know, I just think it's a nice illustration of how mobile communications, wireless communications touch people's lives. You know, and I think they make the world a better world for the reasons we went through there, but they also enrich people's lives. And that's why I like that picture. That's me. <laughs> <laughs>